first talk uh, for this session is given by Sven. He's going to talk about having fun with Docker containers. Thank you, Ben. Do you need to hear me? Does anybody need to hear me? Okay. Um, I work for Docker now, um, so I'm, I'm now slightly biased. But this is loud. Um, after coming and talking to a few people, I figured I'm going to redo this talk more as an introduction to Docker. Um, but who here has used Docker? Who's heard of Docker? Let's start from the beginning. Okay, so there's a few of you who haven't heard of Docker. Excellent. Who has installed Docker? Yeah. Uh, who has done a Docker run? Who's built a Docker container? Who's pushed a Docker container to a hub? Who's pushed a Docker container to a private registry? OK, you guys can leave. <laughs> this talk is not for you. <laughs> OK, so firstly, that kind of shows Docker is uh, the new hotness. It's not actually doing anything technically new. Um, what it's doing is orchestrating a, a set of Linux features that replicate a set of Solaris features that replicate the BSD features that replicate what mainframes used to be able to do in the 60s. Um, and that is workload partitioning. Um, and what that means is that rather than doing virtual machines, which were a massive revolution in the late 90s, um, you can virtualize the environment that an executable runs in. Um, and, and so instead of having to virtualize a computer and then run an operating system in it, what you're doing is you're virtualizing the operating system and running your executable in a more restricted space than it does traditionally. Um, and so the restrictions that you can do is you can, you can restrict it to its own network or uh, restrict all of its network except for a few ports, or you can give it a new private network that talks to a number of containers or number of executables, that sort of thing. Um, you can restrict its memory space, its CPU space, its access to other processes, um, and that sort of thing, which is really handy. But another feature is kind of jail-like in that it, you can give it, or you do give it, its own file system. And so one of the basic things that you can do is I'm running on a Debian box, so this example it doesn't seem quite as fantastic. I don't really want to pull another image, but I can go docker run. Uh, I won't even bother. I'll just do the minor. And what I have here is a virtual Debian box. And I can do all sorts of stupid things, and it won't affect my real computer. Um, so as I'm logged in as root, <laughs> some people are just whiny. I want to be able to kill myself. And apparently, I now have a dead system, but I don't care. And when I go off and run another one, um, I'm back in a normal container. Um, and so one of the ideas there is that we have uh, container images, which are the file system, and then we create a container by layering a, a read-write layer on top of that file system, and then running whatever executable that is on that virtual file system. Um, <coughs> And what that means is we have effectively immutable systems. Um, we can always start from where we want to left off, where we want to start off. Um, so we have effectively we have snapshots. So I can do a few things, um, and the way that we create these images is we make them as small as possible. So there is no Debian database by default. We've got to initialize stuff and, and do that sort of thing. I won't bother. Um, OK, so I actually have Chrome running in a container. Uh, that's my normal way of running Chrome. And I've given it 3 gig of memory, which means that it complains much faster. Um, oh, minus A. OK, but I actually have a whole stack of containers that I've just been running up lying around. Um, so the top two that you can see are those Debian bash sessions that we had. And I could restart them, and I can also docker commit, uh, give it a tag, 
And so whatever commands have run, uh, let's just take that one. Uh, yep, somebody here is having demo fun. All right, so the, the container that I have and what I'm going to call it. And so now I should be able to go docker run. And there I am, and it's even starting bash. And uh, I somehow doubt that it'll find anything because oh, there you go. Um, so my app get update obviously populated some of the database, and it's able to go off and find me things. Um, so that's one of the basic useful things about it. Um, and if we go Docker run, help. Um, you, know, you can rest re restrict things like uh, CPU and memory. Um, the other cool thing you can do is if you're doing something like a DNS server or a DHCP server, you can, instead of using a contained network, you can tell it use the, the, the host network, which basically means you're not containing the network. And you can do that with almost everything, except I think file system, which is a feature I'd really like, but it's kind of hard to implement. Um, so yeah, that's the first thing. Okay, now, yeah, Docker PS. All right, so I'm gonna run bash. Um, most of this computer is just as installed on, you know, when I do a native Debian install, and then I've installed Docker, and then I have a set of containers that implement bash, for example. And so my bash environment has uh, make, whereas uh, if I type make here, I think it won't work. So on my host, I don't have make installed. But in my development environment, which I get into by typing bash, um, yeah, that doesn't work so nicely, does it? Um, I do have make. And that's basically because it means that I have my development environment wherever the heck I go. Um, I don't have to have this notebook if it gets stolen. I just go off and buy another one, install Debian, and then do a Docker pull of my environment. Um, this image is kind of a bit complex. Um, one of the things that I take advantage of is Docker exec. Um, so if I have multiple windows all running bash, they're all actually Docker execing into the one uh, container um, because I'm lazy and it means I have fewer containers running. Um, and then, next thing, let's just go find my talk. Uh, in my make file, the next thing we can do is we can run a website. Presumably that's what most of us end up doing as one of the, the simple first starts. And Yay, a web server. Um, and that's a web server without installing it on my local box. Um, the next step is then starting to build up containers that actually do the jobs that you want to do. Um, and for that, I might go off somewhere else. Um, for example, oh, where am I? Why not? Okay. Boot to Docker. Who here has used boot to Docker? One, two, three, four, five. Basically the same people who've used Docker most. Um, boot to Docker is this lovely little micro distribution of, of Linux that essentially um, is just there to run Docker when you've got an OS X box or Windows box and can't run Docker natively. Um, it's the thing I was working on for the last year and a half until just recently. Um, and now it's being replaced by a new command line, but the distro still exists. Um, the fun thing is that to make this, um, I use a Docker container. And so I have a Docker file. Oh, didn't. All right. So what I've told you about is the runtime of Docker. That's a part that has existed for a very long time with LXC and other similar libvert has been able to do it for a very long time, but it's always been mildly more painful than most people have wanted to do, so we've all gone, let's use Vagrant. Um, <clears throat> and then Docker came along and made running up a container that somebody else has made really simple. 
The other part of this is that they managed to make creating a Docker, file, a Docker image, so the file system that you're going to use, also really simple. Because what you're doing is we have a format called Dockerfile, which has a series of very simple instructions that are kind of shell-like that let you stepwise build an image. Um, this is really not the right one to start with. I wonder. Uh, somebody should have thought this through more. Um, why not? All right, so we have this bash thing that I'm using. And in here, I have a Docker file. And what I'm doing in this Docker file is a series of commands that I would otherwise be doing in Ansible, Puppet, whatever, uh, Rex, if you're a Perl. Pro How many people here still write Perl? I mean, <laughs> cool. Um, as far as I'm concerned, this is a Perl conference, and um, the rest of us are. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes. Okay. So, I'm hoping that this makes a lot of sense to a lot of people because it's supposed to. Um, what the first line does is it says taking an image that somebody else has made, in this case, an image on the Docker Hub called Debian, and this one's the version testing. Um, we basically break up the repository names into the name of the the repository and then a versioning tag, um, and then run a series of commands to install the stuff I use most of the time. Um, and apparently I use Docker Compose, that's new. There you go. Um, meh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I set this up a long time ago and you know, you just use it. And then I have a setup file I mean, setup script that goes off and creates my user. Because typically, when you docker run, your container will by default run as root. Um, there are things happening to improve that significantly um, because the Linux kernel finally has user namespacing that works and so on. Um, but what actually happens when I type bash is it makes sure that these three containers that I have here. Um, are started, and then Docker execs into the shell one, giving me access to my shell. Um, so from my perspective, before I joined the company, I was using this to, to create Docker images for each of my clients, and I was able to get come back to them much faster than with the virtual machines, where I'd often lose the virtual machine and then have to go and recreate them, and apparently I don't like Vagrant as much as I think I should. Um, and this worked much better for me. Um, so that's what Docker Build does. Um, where was I in my talk? Oh, yes. So in this lovely, massive Docker file, we install a heck of a lot more things because building an ISO from scratch actually is relatively complicated. Um, we go off and build our own Linux kernel in a container. Um, and one of the things I, I haven't mentioned yet is that each one of these instructions creates a separate layer. So Docker containers and Docker images are made up of images, you know, image layers. And so you can start from the middle of one, one of these things and continue on. And the really cool thing about that is that um, when I'm building boot to Docker, for example, this first part where I'm doing an app get install, that'll run probably once. And then after that, if I change the kernel version, the next Docker build will start off at the, the end line because that's the one I've changed. Um, that's kind of really useful when, when you've structured your Docker file so that the things that don't change often happen first. And then as you go further down, those things that change more often get run. And so you, you, you don't have to go, OK, I need to make clean. Uh, now I blow everything away, and four hours later I have my ISO, um, which is kind of frustrating. Whereas with this, if down the bottom I've gone off and done some work on uh, one of the scripts that gets injected into the ISO, all of the rest of building the kernel and building all the rest of the tools doesn't need to happen again. Um, 
So the, that, that sort of caching I find really useful, but you've, you've obviously got to structure your, your uh, Docker file carefully. And the last thing this do does is cat and ISO straight out to your terminal. Yes. Um, very useful. That's actually a, a, a remarkably useful meme where you, know, you use a Docker file as your entire build script. That way you know exactly what your dependencies are because you're starting with a very, very bare Debian um, file, or a Debian distro box. Whereas if you do this on your own computer, you've already got some libraries installed. You may not notice that you needed some esoteric thing. Everybody knows that this stuff won't work without CPIO, and uh, this one's really boring. Um, didn't used to be. Yeah, life's gotten better. There used to be all sorts of really weird little ISO, I mean, libs in there to make stuff work. I think we now build them all. Ah, here's another lot. So yes, that's, to me, the fact that we've made a way for you to specify completely all of the dependencies you need to do something is probably the most useful part of Docker. Um, somebody maybe a year ago pointed out that this means escrow is trivial um, because the people who get your CD or whatever it is that you've thrown into escrow five years later actually have a recipe for everything that's needed, not just, oh, go to a Linux box and type make. Um, you know, yeah, the mini escrow instructions are kind of almost that useless. Um, so, yeah. All right, where am I? All right. So here we are. Well, Docker, PS. Apparently, I'm currently running my shell and a browser. Yay. Uh, so I have my web. I'm going to run a website just to show. Let me show you. Okay. So the first example that I showed originally, uh, wherever it is, that one, that is the default page that you'll see when you run up the Nginx container that we've made. Well, better said that the Nginx project is made because they're actually the ones making um, the containers. If you look on the Docker Hub, Can somebody come and type for me? <laughs> no. <laughs> rah, rah. OK. Is there a way? Explore official repositories. OK. So we have this thing called official repositories, which are repositories which don't have a username. And originally, we were building these ourselves. And then somewhere about a year ago, we started persuading each of the projects to start managing their own. So like the Fedora um, image is actually made by uh, Red Hat nowadays, uh, or at least by the Fedora project. And they have a number of ancient releases of Fedora. Um, I assume 22 was a long time ago. Um, and from those, you can then base your workflows. In my case, I almost never use Fedora, being a Debian person. Except at one stage I was doing something with Publican, and Publican is a Red Hat internal doc tool, and so of course it works best on Fedora. It's exactly the same thing as, as the examples that I was giving before, except it does it from, from Fedora, and then yum update, and yum install, and off we go. Um, and then suddenly everybody can run this tool that requires all sorts of weird things, including Java, I think, or at least it, it used to. Um, I'm sure things have changed, honest. Okay, example number two is I'm not modifying the Nginx container. What I'm doing is I'm bind mounting in a directory that's on my host file system, the same host as the Docker daemon's running, and putting that into Nginx. Um, and let's hope this works. looking great. All right, voila, and there's my website. Um, this is pretending to be Docker. Um, what did I type? Does anybody know? And apparently it's pretending to be the uh, 
uh, company supported, commercially supported Docker engine. There you go. Isn't that lovely? So what that shows is that when you're prototyping, you can quickly create a web server or some other environment that has your work in it without going through all of the, the Docker bits and pieces. Um, instead, uh, let's just hope I can remember where all this stuff is. When I'm normally working on this sort of thing, I would normally have a Docker file. Not today. Right, why not? Right, this Docker file is a little different. This is a, actually a Docker file that I used for pushing that same website to S3. And so I'm going off from Debian as usual because I'm very lazy, installing all the dependencies I need to then install one of the older versions of Amazon's uh, CLI program that will then push these files off. And so I don't have to worry about Python or Python libraries or all of these sorts of things on my host uh, changing or causing any sorts of problems. This will pretty much always work. Um, especially as I'm using some historical version of Debian. Um, I'm sure that's you know, not going to be there forever, but if you use Debian Jesse in 10 years' time, our Debian Jesse image will hopefully still be there, and the repositories will still be there. How long do Debian support their stuff for? <laughs> no, no, no. Their, their repositories are still there after the release. So you know, you're, you're talking about the version of support where they update stuff. But their repos, when they've stopped updating, yeah, will. They, they, they yeah, yeah, but three releases ago are still on the repository servers, and you can still. Okay. Really? Yeah, and the best effort is I did nothing, so the files are still there. Sweet. Thank you very much, because I'm suddenly curious and want to know. Um, because I've been trying to convince somebody to start mirroring this stuff for posterior. I mean, posterity. Uh, wasn't me. I didn't do it. Um, and then I have a script that does stuff, but you know, basically everybody has that little something that, that makes things work. Um, so if I were going to replicate what I did before, I would probably. Need to remember that directory there. Oh, you. I thought you said this was going to work. <laughs> All right, so if I make a Docker file in here, I would go from nginx and then add dot to there, and that's pretty much it. Um, so I'm taking the configuration and all of the, the layers of the Nginx, and it's probably one, um, and throwing all my files into the right place. And then I can go docker run, no, docker build. Um, and off we go and do it. And if I, well, this is not interesting enough to do that for, so docker run minus p80. And strangely enough, it'll look exactly the same. Voila. And so I now have this container that I can push to a registry or push to the hub, and other people can grab, and we'll get exactly the same result, even if all the dependencies change. In this example's kind of very, very basic. So that's where you start. You know, you, well, what I think one of the things people should do to start is to redo their build system so that it all happens in a Docker file. Because then you have specified everything you need to build this thing. And anybody comes along to your project, they can just go Docker build, and it works. The next thing that I start trying to get people to do is probably something that's considered somewhat pearlish. Um, let's see. Um, this is where I'm trying hard not to say rude things about Go people. Um, this last line is unusual. 
Apparently, Go people are convinced they do testing, but they don't run the test in their build system. They run the test somewhere else. Um, but the point with this is that I have here a setup that uses a particular version of Go and then brings in my source code, brings in the dependencies, and normally, over time, I would replace uh, that line there um, where I'm basically telling Go to go get all the other dependencies I don't have with the much more explicit lines above because that way I have actually said in this Docker file, these are all the things that this project depends on. And at some later date, if those things change, I can go back in my history, grab an old image, and throw it up somewhere so that other people can see how it used to work. Um, and so if I were to build this and then push it to the hub and leave it like that forever, then you've always got a version of this that built, ran its tests, and works, even if something goes wrong somewhere else. And that image contains the source, and the binaries, and all the dependencies, all the tool chain, everything. Um, which sounds really, really big, but then you've got to remember that each one of these things is a layer, and the first layer there is one that you'd probably share amongst everybody who's working on or using that version of Golang. Um, and so if you've already got it, the next time you need all of this stuff, it won't download it. So like one of the things I've done with these examples is that I haven't, I, I previously pulled all these images, so it won't take time, but um, let's pull the image that I rarely use. Okay. Going. It takes a while because obviously we are downloading an awful lot of stuff over conference Wi-Fi, which is a bit mean, and I'm gonna stop, because whatever. Um, now, I don't know Vagrant well enough. Who here uses Vagrant lots? Can you do the same thing with Vagrant? Yeah, you, you, can, you can build an image and Yeah, but use it. is building the image the same kind of full specification of everything that you've done? Yep. yep. So apart from the fact that you end up with this massive VM that doesn't share file space, it's basically the same animal. Yeah. Cool. Cool. I like Docker more because all I'm running is so few things, but yeah. It's, it's good that the solutions have converged so much. Um, okay, so how many seconds do I have? <sighs> Sweet. All right. So the other question that somebody asked me was, what happens if I've got half a dozen websites and I don't want them to hurt each other if somebody hacks one of them? And I kind of go, that's actually a really good example. And so I made one. What I did is I'm running, in, in the proxy example, I'm running up several containers, each of which have their own Nginx. They could be application servers. It could be anything that talks HTML. <laughs> Well, HTTP, I mean. And they're sitting there with a name as a container with no access to the, n nobody from the outside world can access them because they're not hooked up to your host um, network. They're sitting there in their own little network. And so they can't interfere with each other. Right now they're totally secure because they can't be hacked. And then in the last um, command, what I'm doing is I'm running another Nginx server which is doing a proxy to each of them. And so if it gets a re request, you know, slash site one, it will go off and talk to site one, the uh, site one Nginx container. And so the, the magic there is the dash dash link line where we're specifying the name of the container that we set up previously and saying, go get that information from there. And lastly, um, the really complicated bit I've never used Nginx before, so forgive me if it's horrid. There we go. It, it's, it's a really simple, um, well, it turned out to be very simple. Uh, <laughs> the challenge was supposed to be drop the mic. Great. Oh, good. Well, that'll teach me. Um, apparently, I'm not allowed to do that. And I 
didn't do it here, did I? No. Hooray! I got lucky. So, I set up nothing as its default. I cannot spell. Oh, look, complicated sign. <laughs> yep, so there you go. Um, and obviously, you know, you'd use HA proxy or something kind of uh, more serious. Um, but to me, the, the massive value of Docker is the build pipeline. You, you, you can re-architect everything so that your artifacts are going to be all bundled up. And then I can debug that at any time because everything's there. Um, now, if you're worried about security, that's the flip side of all of this. You take this build container and then you pull out those few things that are needed into a container that has no other file system. Um, and some lovely person implemented my talk from LCA uh, where effectively you use iNotify to sit there and watch what files are needed. You throw them in a container and nothing else. And so if somebody hacks your web app, they get into a, a, a container that has no bash, no tools, nothing. And you just kind of go, I'm not, I'm not sure what a security person, a, a, a hacker can do when they've broken into something that has nothing but the executable. You, know, you just kind of, great. Now I have to, well, I can't byte edit the application, so I can't force, yeah. So that's, that's the next challenge, is, is for people to work out how exactly something that has no other tools and just is a wrapped up doohickey can then be broken out of. Presumably, it's easy. Somebody will work it out. Um, cool. Hopefully, I have uh, given you some ideas on how simple it is for you to move something that you're doing into Docker and that it's worth doing. Um, because, hey, it changed my life. Thank you, Sven. We have lots of questions. We'll start at the what? front. No, you don't. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, one thing that I've always been wondering about with Docker with is things like how do you have, how do you deal with a uh, like a database server where you're going to need a chunk of a large chunk of data, um, disk space, read write, uh, all that sort of thing. Is it do you import into that container a separate sort of, uh, you know, separate block device for that file system? Or That's how does that work? Yeah. Cool. You, you can pretty much do any of the sorts of things that you would normally do. Um, and not being a database person, I'd go, I'd just do it, get somebody to do it for me. So how, uh, how do you avoid a 40 gigabyte or 100 gigabyte container? Oh, okay. You, you would definitely not make the database store part of the container, yes. It would be bind either, like, so the example I gave is where I'm bind mounting in a directory. That directory is on the host file system. So you can do that as a partition and then access it raw. You, you can do pretty much anything. I mean, fundamentally what a container is, is just a set of kernel settings on an executable. That's it. And whether you then go and run multiple executables in that container space or only one, like we kind of religiously tell people, or give it access to external hardware or to the, um, the video card or to audio. Those are all things that you can use a, a flag to do. Um, so yeah, yeah, you, you would definitely not put it in your image, yeah. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, I've got two related questions. Um, the first one is uh, uh, I've used Linux containers to LXC directly on my own laptop and it works awesome. I've really am loving the performance because going from VirtualBox to that is just amazing. Um, so uh, the two questions. One is, is Docker actually just using that same underlying technology or is it something else that it's using that's container-like? And the second question, a little related, is that we have some developers on Macs um, and they get really poor performance from VirtualBox um, with our environments and I heard that Docker on a Mac is basically um, running Docker in a virtualization like a virtual box. Yep. And so I presume there's no performance increase, but one of them tested it and said it was performing faster. So I was a bit confused, like I don't know how 
there was a better performance with Docker and VirtualBox versus just VirtualBox as it is. So two questions, the underlying technology, and secondly, <coughs> why would Mac performance be any different? Okay. So yes, Docker uses the same kernel features that LXC does. For a while, or originally, it actually used LXC and just wrapped LXC itself. But that became, it, we, we weren't moving at the same pace, basically. And then LXC was working towards stabilizing and we were working towards features. Um, and so we've pulled that out and, and now do our own thing, but fundamentally it's the same. Um, with respect to virtual machine performance, that's horribly hard. Um, in the 90s, I used to have a P3 laptop that I ran Linux on and then ran VMware and ran Windows inside VMware and that was faster than running Windows directly on the hardware. And it comes down to things like caching strategies, file system um, request blocking, I mean uh, grouping strategies and, and all sorts of funny variables. And if they're using the latest OS X, I've heard there's some major improvements in file I.O. Um, which may then have fault flow on effects into the virtual machine. Um, you know, one of the tricks that we used to do was to tell our virtual machine not to sync to disk. And so you get file I.O. that was incredibly fast, which is perfect for a build system. You know, so you're doing development in Windows, but you've told your virtual machine to just be lazy about writing. And so nothing blocks. And as you hit build and off it goes. Um, so yeah, it's it's complicated that way. So do you notice know there's any difference between that same person running VirtualBox and then running Docker? Has Docker done something to improve the performance of the underlying virtualization? Yes, I, I, I did a lot of work. <laughs> okay, so if they're using Docker Machine or Docker or the old boot to Docker that I wrote, um, those two create a very small little micro distribution Linux that's created specifically just to run Docker. Okay. It has almost nothing else running. Right. And so if you're comparing that to running an Ubuntu box or a Debian box, yeah, it's going to be a okay. decently faster. Until you hit some other problem because, yeah, this was a part-time job, honest. Uh, I have a, an answer and a, a question. The answer is I can still get ham on the archives. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, so the, and, and for that reason, your Docker file, if that continues happening, is going to be useful for a long time. It's... No, because my question is, um, with images sitting on the archives for so long, there's obvious security implications for that. As someone that likes to um, patch your, how does one go about doing that? Do we have to rebuild images? Is there an orchestration program, uh, process around? upgrading or patching as opposed to rebuilding, and how is that impacting um, Docker's approach to security? Yep. Okay, so effectively, Docker images are both immutable and ephemeral. And so the idea is you don't patch them, um, you create a new image and you rebuild. And while that makes you squirm in some ways, you, you the, the other thing that you, you then start doing when you have immutable infrastructure is you don't put the data in there. It goes somewhere else. And so you can just go, okay, so this has a vulnerability. I'm gonna kill that and bring up a new container. And these things are relatively close to inst instant. So um, the hard part is rebuilding. Now Docker Hub has t two ways of, of making images available. The one I use the most is actually to get the Docker Hub to build my images and use webhooks to automatically rebuild. And then you can also link that to other images so that if those other images change, it also rebuilds. So what we ought to be doing is having a, a, an automated build that goes off my GitHub repository that's also linked to Debian testing or whatever I'm building on so that if, if either of them change, the Hub will rebuild. Um, it's still not perfect because people like me also want to have every historical release still there in its historical form. Because if somebody has that historical form and finds a bug, I need that to debug because the patched version is useless to me. Um, I, 
it, it's the same as the, the, you guys glibly standing up there and saying you must always upgrade to your latest version of libraries and all the rest of it where I kind of go, I did that once and it was a three month you know, enterprise size ordeal and the end result was yes, but the new version doesn't support half the shit we need. So no, get stuffed. Um, and that's where containers are also, again, useful because you know you, you don't make SSH available to the world because it's not even running in that container. You don't do it in a container. You have an SSH container. So somebody can break into the SSH container, then they need to break into the next thing and the next thing. Yeah. So all of this stuff is sort of firewalled. But the state of the art is immature and uh, yeah, go break us. Break more, be mean. I'm oh, sorry we've got to call it quits. We've got another speaker to start what? in about two minutes or so. <laughs> so thank you very much, Finn. And here's a memento for you to take with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.